Chadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kanjabi Hadi Radha Madhava Kanjabi Jaya Radha Madhava Kanjabi Hadi Jaya Om Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Parivitaka Charja Asta Tarasata Si Srimad His Divine Grace Isi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shira Prabhupada Ki Ananta Koti Vaishnavarinda Ki Kishor Kishori Ki Jai Some of the persons with us this evening are Illinois Institute of Technology students who have sat through this presentation already. So try to do it a little differently for their benefit. But no harm in hearing the Gita's message summarized again and again. There's a very nice passage in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Some of you know who is Lord Chaitanya. He's on our altar. On our left or the altar to the right. Lord Chaitanya is the one who gave this chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as the primary means of spiritual perfection for this age. So in the bi biography, one of the primary biographies of his life, it, it describes that he was living many years, over half of his life, in Jagannath Puri. And he would rise very early in the morning and go to the temple of Jagannath, attend the morning arti, worship of Lord Jagannath, from the pujaris, he would receive Jagannath Prasad. Then he would straight away go to visit his dear devotee, Haridas. And he would give Haridas Thakur the Prasad of Lord Jagannath. And they would discuss topics of Krishna together for some time. And then he would go to another temple, a temple of Gopinath, called Tota Gopinath, because it was in a garden area. And there he would see the deity of Gopinath and chant and dance in ecstasy. And then he would sit and hear from one of his dear devotees, Gadadhar Pandit. And Gadadhar Pandit would recite Srimad Bhagavatam every day for some hours. So Lord Chaitanya would sit and hear Srimad Bhagavatam from Gadadhar Pandit which must have been really amazing experience. And the author or biographer of Chaitanya Charitamrita says he would hear the pastimes of Prahlad Maharaj and Dhruva Maharaj from beginning to end. And when it was ended, he would say, say it again, say it again. Not like, have I ever heard you that one already? Give me another one. Some, something I haven't heard yet. That is to say, spiritual topics are like an ocean that has no bottom. Even oceans have a bottom, but the ocean of transcendental knowledge has no bottom. You just dive deeper and you can't find the bottom. So hearing spiritual topics again and again is nice. <clears throat> Bhagavad Gita. Is anybody here that's new and is unfamiliar with what Bhagavad Gita is? Should I need to explain what is what it is? Bhagavad Gita. Okay. 
you have heard of Krishna, right? Yes. So, Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is a form, the original form of the personality of Godhead who appeared in India over 5,000 years ago. And one of the reasons for his appearance was to give transcendental teachings. It's explained in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, why he appears. And that's one of the reasons, to give transcendental teachings. And those teachings are preserved in 700 verses that make up Bhagavad Gita. There's many things to say, but it's, it's a classic text written in Sanskrit that's endured over these thousands of years as a uh, treasure house of wisdom, profound understanding of life and the values of life and the reality beyond the one that we can see, transcendental reality. The, 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 so the, what the Bhagavad Gita is, is many things. It can be described or analyzed in many different ways. Um, this is just one approach, it's not the approach. For example, you can say Bhagavad Gita is a treatise on self-realization and God-realization. Little Prabhupada story. Prabhupada, that's, when I say Prabhupada, that's seated on this raised seat. That's Prabhupada or Murti of Prabhupada. He came to America over 50 years ago to fulfill an instruction of his spiritual master to take Bhagavad Gita and these ancient teachings of the Vedas to the English speaking parts of the world. So he did, he came. And one time he was visiting in New York. This was at a time, 1972, when they didn't have TSA, they didn't have the kind of restrictions that they have today. So when somebody arrived at the airport, you could go right to the gate. And so we went right to the gate, JFK, New York City, and there were well, you know, a few hundred of us receiving Prabhupada at the gate. And we were sedate, sitting down, softly chanting a little bit before, you know, singing and dancing, but sitting softly chanting until the plane arrived and then everybody stood up. And then when people started coming off the plane, it wasn't just standing up, it was dancing and dancing. And then Prabhupada came out the gate and everyone started leaping in the air and throwing flower petals and beating gongs and driving the security people wild. What, what are these people up to? And Prabhupada was a few hundred devotees escorted Prabhupada to a place where he was uh, in the uh, lounge. He was seated in the seat. Everyone sat at his feet and it was, the intention was to have a a reporter, a New York City, some kind of a news media, I think, newspaper reporter. So the reporter had his microphone and said, Swamiji, you've come to America, you've established many temples here in America, you have many, many followers, you must have a, a mission or a message that you'd like to give to the people of, of America. Could you share that message? And right away, I was in the audience and I was sharing this with another devotee who was in that same audience at the same time. Uh, Prabhupada immediately said, I've come to teach you who you are. Your question, knowledge of the self, because you have forgotten. And then he went on to say, this is the wisdom of Bhagavad Gita. And Bhagavad Gita teaches, and we went on to give the ABC of Bhagavad Gita's message about the self. That's my mission, to teach you who you really are because you have forgotten. 
reporter didn't know what to say after that. So one way to say what Bhagavad Gita is, it's a treatise on self-realization. But at the same time, self-realization is not complete without God-realization because we're part of God. So it must include self-realization to be complete, must include realization of God. So that's another way of describing what Bhagavad Gita is. Another is to say, it's a text that teaches the yoga systems. Because most people today, when they hear yoga, they think primarily of one thing. Asanas are sitting postures and you get your yoga mat and you get in comfortable clothing and you go to a yoga class and you do yoga. That's what yoga is. And sometimes the yoga teacher, they'll, in addition, they'll teach pranayama or breath drilling, respiratory to help make the mind peaceful and so you can concentrate and feel better. <laughs> and that's yoga, those two. But those two, that's just two parts of an eightfold yoga system that's described in one of the 18 chapters of Bhagavad Gita. Dhyan yoga is also part of this eightfold yoga system. Karma yoga, Gyan yoga, Dhyan yoga, Raja yoga, Hatha yoga, Bhakti yoga, Sankhya yoga. It's, it's a treatise on the yoga systems and where is it meant to take you? Where do you begin and where does it go to? To, so it's a treatise on the yoga systems. Another way to describe is found in the introduction. Those of you that have a Bhagavad Gita will know and have read it, will know that about 180 years ago or so, one of the teachers in disciplic succession prior to our present time wrote a commentary on Bhagavad Gita and says, Bhagavad Gita is describing five things. That's another way of analyzing. It's describing the living entity, the self, describing Ishwara, the controller of everything, time, kala, activity, karma, and material nature, prakriti. Bhagavad Gita is a study of those five topics. You mix them all together, you get everything that exists that we can perceive and beyond what we can perceive. So that's another way of analyzing what Bhagavad Gita is. An analysis of those five elements of existence. So this is a, yet another one. And it, you can, it can be unlimited. It's just a, a lens through which to look at the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. And in a moment I'll explain why these six are, are identified, because there could be more than six or another set. Uh, Bhagavad Gita is, while it's teaching, for example, meditation, as one of the yoga processes found in chapter six, Bhagavad Gita, it interestingly takes place on a battlefield. For those of you that are not familiar with Bhagavad Gita, this is Krishna speaking, and over here is Arjuna who is hearing. And it's a dialogue. Arjuna is asking questions, Krishna is giving responses in teachings, of transcendental knowledge. Arjuna's position, he's a great hero, a warrior, a chivalrous prince due to become part of the royal family that's ruling the world. And Krishna is his dear friend. But when Arjuna starts asking questions, he's asking Krishna, don't just take the position of friend, but take the position of guru. Please instruct me. What is my duty? How am I to decide what I should do in this perplexing circumstance? And at the end, uh, the yogi, the bhakta yogi, Arjuna, goes forward with the battle, or as before he was not wanting to, but acting in um, a purpose of protecting 
innocent people and thereby fulfilling his duty because that's what powerful kings are supposed to do, to give protection to innocent people. Um, this is a, a picture of the cover of Bhagavad Gita or one of the ed editions of Bhagavad Gita, recent publication. And it stands through all these hundreds of years, centuries, as an outstanding literature for philosophical and spiritual wisdom. So the, the, the presentation this evening is going to cover these six points and they, um, this way, they, why these six are selected because they're, they're elements within the Bhagavad Gita itself that teach um, how to live our lives in a way that the path of living your life this way leads you to higher consciousness and realization of Krishna. So the list is on the right. The Sanskrit terms that are found directly in Bhagavad Gita are there. For example, Samadarshana. And if, if anybody would like a, a copy of this presentation so you don't have to get your camera out and take pictures of things. One of these two, is Sodanandana? Raise your hand. See him and he'll give you a copy if you want to get a copy. He's your MC for this evening so you'll be easy to spot him. Samadarshana, I'm going to go through these one by one. Samadarshana means equal vision. We'll describe it. Icha means desire or choice. So the living entity being part of the supreme living entity has free will, tiny free will, but we have free will. We make choices. Every moment we're making choices. And the role of making choices is a very important part of life and it's a very important part of the message of Bhagavad Gita. And when making choices, it's encouraged in Bhagavad Gita to live your life or make choices in such a way you minimize the pain and suffering of other living beings simply due to your existence. Within reason, then its standards are, are given. We'll explore it. Uh, then to impart teachings, you can impart teachings by what you say. But more important is how you conduct your life, not what you say, but what you do, who you are and how you act. Acharya, teaching by example. Amanitva, we'll touch on this one. It's an important item for spiritual life is humility. There's what it is or what it isn't and we'll discuss a little bit. And then the final one is affection. And that's the foundation of all the others. It leads to and it's the foundation of all the others. Uh, these are intended to be principles to live by and principles that help us have proper vision to know where to go, vision that guides our action and vision that helps shape our character. There's so many things to say about Bhagavad Gita, it's hard to not say them. <laughs> Real education, because reading Bhagavad Gita is, it's education, it's spiritual education from the supreme educator, Krishna, to his dear devotee, Arjuna, but really the intended audience is us. So it's, it's teaching us character. Real education is character development. Education that doesn't have character development is abusive or it's misleading or it's, it's hurtful, not helpful, not, it's very problematic. So it, there must be, and it does, the Bhagavad Gita presents these principles to live by 
so that proper character can be shaped and we can live our lives progressively towards spiritual elevation. That's what the image is showing. Here's the, the fellow over here deciding to ascend the staircase and up there there's, that's Krishna. Um, an important part of the whole of Bhagavad Gita, kind of underlying all of these principles is bhakti. Bhakti commonly is translated as devotion, but it's more than just devotion, it's activity or service in a mood of devotion to the object of love, Krishna, a loving exchange with Krishna expressed in the form of loving service. So um, these values and character that's being passed on by Bhagavad Gita or via the teaching of Bhagavad Gita has as its basis and support bhakti. And with these values in place, then um, it helps us understand how to conduct the activities of life in relation to the Supreme, including all our activities with, with others and the world around us, you know, harmony with God and harmony within nature and other living beings. It's, that's the um, practical result. So we'll take a little journey with Srila Prabhupada as he guides us through these teachings of Bhagavad Gita. We'll hear the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, but relying upon the guidance we receive from him. So here's the first of the six principles, Sama Darshana. Those of you from India, you know what Darshan means. We, when you come before the deity, it's let's go to the temple and have Darshan. Deity Darshan means seeing the deity. So Sama Darshan is seeing with equal vision all varieties of life. Along the windowsill, there's a whole bunch of plants. And then interestingly, right in the floor over here is a big tree. And that tree's been here for, since I've been here, I don't know, some number of years. They trimmed the tree down a bit. I, I felt bad for the tree, poor tree. But trees, ha anyway, trees have the capacity, their limbs grow back, ours don't. But so there's a living entity that's attending kirtan every day, so many times a day. How fortunate, how fortunate. For years, every, every day, every day in and day out, he's hearing. So respect goes to all living entities, whether it's a tree or an animal or whatever the life form is. Now, <clears throat> so that the teaching of Bhagavad Gita takes one its message is beyond distinctions of the body, color of the body, caste of the body, creed of the body, language of the body, the passport of the body, what your socioeconomic position is within a particular stage of life or in another lifetime or whatever. The teaching of Bhagavad Gita teaches one to go beyond those considerations. Why? Because that's not, the, the covering is not who we really are. The equal, we had this discussion uh, yesterday evening in Palatine. One of the questions that was, I was asked to focus on is how to see the distinction between a behavior of a person and the person. Because the person is not the behavior. The material energy that covers the soul is not the person. And the speech and the conduct and whatever, it's born of impetuses of the modes of nature and karma and to some degree free will, but it's not who the living entity is. The living entity, as the image shows, and you'll see this image again, it's the spark of life within. That's who we are. So there's a, a verse directly that expresses this in Bhagavad Gita. Pandit is becoming, it's in the uh, Webster's Dictionary now. It's a Sanskrit word. 
but it's used so often in English vernacular that's now a dictionary word. Pandit means a learned person. Pandita samadarshana is the verse from Bhagavad Gita. Vidya vanaya sampane brahmani gavi hastani shuni chaiva swapaki cha pandita samadarshana. A, a, a wise person, a learned person, sees equally the spiritual spark within. In explaining this, Prabhupada says it's not that when you see a tiger, you go and embrace a tiger. You may keep your distance from a tiger. So behavior is appropriate for the embodiment. You still recognize differences of embodiment and you act appropriately for the embodiment. But that's not the self. It's not the true person. The true person is the spark of life within. Um, and based upon that true person being the spark of life within, that, that's the basis of equal vision. Like the tree over there that's hearing the kirtan. The form of life is not human. But the spirit soul is getting enormous spiritual benefit just standing there and hearing kirtan every day. Um, the equal vision principle allows us to see other entities also as persons because the person is not the body, the person is the soul. So, quote, personhood is embodied by all living beings. And so that's that respect goes to the living being within. Another graphic image that says the same thing. Um, dignity isn't only meant for humans, but all forms of life. We're meant to demonstrate dignity towards all. That's a, a consequence of the teaching of Bhagavad Gita. You see that these values then fill out a way of life. Okay, so that's the first of six. And the second one is Icha. Icha uh, means, literally it means desire. Here it's being presented as choice. And uh, living entities, because we're part of the supreme living entity, we have free will. Whatever qualities are there in the whole the tiny part has, but tiny. For example, when at the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna makes a choice of asking Krishna what to do. He doesn't have to, but he chooses to ask Krishna what to do. And at the end of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna also honors the free will choice capacity of Arjuna and says, I've explained everything. I've responded to your questions, and now you make a choice. You do what you feel you must do. There's no um, force or imposition upon Krishna because now he's the teacher or he's God giving teachings to his dependent. There's no force involved at all. Rather, he speaks openly, truthfully, and with very evident affection for Krishna and similarly Arjun um, for affection for one another. Um, similar message, K Krishna is acknowledging. It's, 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 it's helpful to understand what Krishna is like. He doesn't force us anything. He, he has the power to do anything, but he doesn't force us to do anything. He gives us, we have freedom, and he doesn't force us. It, 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 it's kind of obvious, but I'll say it anyway. In the state of perfection, in this state of perfection, there's condition of love. Love of the Supreme. And I've had, I've been asked this question 
at least 50 times. If misuse of free will is the cause of our problem, why doesn't Krishna just take free will away from us? Because then we wouldn't have a problem. But then we also wouldn't have love. Because love is, you can say yes or no. If you can't say yes or no, it's no love. Like somebody grabbing you by your shirt collar and saying, look, love me or else. And there's no or else. All right? Yeah, yeah, okay. I love you. I love you. That's not love. There's the option to say no. So in the state of perfection, there's the option to say no. Instead, we just say yes. But supposing we say no. Well, Krishna doesn't take the option to, to say no away from us. He could. But he doesn't because it's our, it's our nature. And the nature in the pure state, once again, is a condition of love. So he invites us. Please come and join a loving relationship with me. And we can say yes or no. Literally, our acharyas speak like this, but it's also, if you think about it carefully, it's true. At every moment, we're making choices. Now, the range of what we can choose might be very limited. It's limited particularly by guna and karma. For example, we may choose, I want to be a millionaire. Go ahead, choose it. And it may or may not happen just because we choose it. And according to the teaching of Bhagavad Gita, the more that one goes down in terms of bad karma, bad activity has bad consequences and darker modes of nature, the mode of ignorance instead of the illumination of knowledge, uh, our options get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, those of you that are from India or have been to India, an image that, that makes a lot of sense to me is a, a cow is taken out each morning by the people that own the cow to some place and they have a rope. They put one end of the rope in the ground in a stake and then the cow can eat grass within a certain circumference, you know, out to that range and then in, into that range and that's it, that's the freedom. And the longer the rope, the more they have the option for eating more grass in different places. Or the shorter the rope, the less. Similarly, living entities have a longer or a shorter rope based on our karma and our past association with the modes of nature. The mode of goodness allows more freedom. Good karma allows more freedom. Although voluntarily we accept some restriction, it looks like, oh, it's too restrictive. But it allows more freedom, actually. Freedom of the spirit and freedom of choices. Now, we may choose to say no to some things, but we have the option at least to say no. We have freedom. Anyway. Choice is, a, is a, an important topic. And how to exercise proper choice according to proper values, values that elevate consciousness as opposed to the other kind that degrade consciousness. Last slide in this section. So <clears throat> in making choices, this is a, a, a powerful message of Bhagavad Gita. The, the best reason for making a choice about something is the principle of love. And when that principle of love is reposed upon the Supreme, making choices that are pleasing to the Supreme, pleasing to Krishna out of love. I, in this past week, I've had five or six discussions about people trying to become vegetarian and wanting some support in becoming vegetarian, mainly college students. 
So you can start here or here or here or here. But like, you know, you shouldn't kill animals because animals have to suffer. So be nonviolent and be vegetarian. Or it's better for your health because medical studies show it's better for your health. Or you have more energy, so you can be vegetarian because you have more energy. Or it, the more people are vegetarian, the, there's more food for the whole world, and so be vegetarian so there's more food for the whole world, etc. Et there's scientific reasons, and there's health reasons, and there's humanitarian reasons, and nonviolent reasons. But the most important and sustainable reason of all is we, we do what we do because it's pleasing to Krishna. So we're not just vegetarian movement or organization. We, we're a spiritual organization. We, we, we only accept the followers of Bhagavad Gita. Read it carefully. We only accept that which is first offered to Krishna. And vegetarian or foods in the mode of goodness are those foods that are offerable to Krishna. And that's why we do it, based on a principle of love. It connects with the last item of this list of six. If you notice carefully, all five connect with number six. The goal is to connect in love with the Supreme. So that's two down, four to go. Equal vision and making choices and making choices that take one in the direction of ahimsa or Nonviolent, in, in very simple terms, live your life in such a way that the pain and suffering that others experience because of your existence is less. When you're making your choices, consider how others are going to be affected by the choices that you make. Not just, it seems right, so you do it, without considering how it's going to affect other people, or other, not just people, other beings. You know, nonviolence. It's a principle. Going back to the principle of the real being is the soul within. So what's going to be beneficial for the spiritual elevation of other beings or the detriment of spiritual elevation of other beings before you speak something or before you do something, before you make your choices? Let those choices be governed in, in this, according to this principle of nonviolence. And it's not just Bhagavad Gita. All spiritual teachings have this as an underlying principle, nonviolence. Now, a big pause on this one. Um, nonviolence doesn't mean pacifism. Now, to some people, that's what it means. So I was giving this example when discussing it at Illinois Institute of Technology. Some time ago, I was one time visiting in India. I was walking along a sidewalk and I saw this really big bully kid literally beating, smashing in the face with his hand and with his fist, a small boy. And the boy was trying to protect his face and hold his arms up in the air and crying and screaming and you know he tried to run away and the bully grabbed him and then started beating him again and beating him again now what do you do when a situation like that happens well I'm, I'm nonviolent I'm not going to get involved in violence because I'm nonviolent I couldn't do that I mean the bully was probably a lot stronger than me <laughs> but I couldn't just like let him continue to beat on this little boy. So I, I, so I won't, rather than describing what happened, it, I just speaking, I, I did something and it, it ended up breaking up the situation without the detail. Nonviolent doesn't mean pacifism. You stand by and watch abuse take place because you're nonviolent. Now, when I was introduced to Bhagavad Gita, like many others of my generation, it was during the Vietnamese War, 1960s. Big, you know, peace, love, anti-war. 
And the movement, it was like the, the sentiment that was moving my generation and young people of our times. And here comes Bhagavad Gita that's taking place on a battlefield. I remember very distinctly, I've shared this before, when I got to that part, I just put the Bhagavad Gita down and said, forget it. I don't know what this is about, but if it's encouraging war, I'm not gonna have anything to do with it, forget it. And I was angry. And then I, little time passed, a couple of days, and I stepped back and said, why am I getting angry? Where's that anger coming from? I'm just reading a book. And I don't even know what the book is saying about the situation. So I, my realization, this is just like, you know, a kid saying, the issue is I have a problem in my relationship with Krishna. I don't even know what Krishna is going to say, but I have like the, the anger is arising from a relationship with issue, Krishna issue that I have. I don't even know what that is because I just, I couldn't even pronounce Krishna's name properly. So how do I have an issue with him? But I, it was somehow I could understand that. So I kept reading it. And then gradually I can understand this point. And of course, in discussing Bhagavad Gita with people of, of, of I say my or our generation, it's, it was a big deal. It's not about pacifism. When there's necessity, then protection requires proper use of language, proper use of action, so that in, innocent people don't have to suffer. Violence, or its counterpart, nonviolence, uh, is not just behavior, but it's um, speech, cruel words, not acting in such a way that others feel distressed or confused by what you're doing or saying. Um, another interesting teaching that's presented, particularly by Prabhupada in his purports, is withholding knowledge. The example I gave, and we're, we're halfway done. The example I gave me was, supposing um, somebody's a medical doctor and they did their day at the hospital or clinic and they're walking home. They have a little black bag that has all their medicines and medical stuff in it. And as they're walking, they see somebody on the sidewalk hemorrhaging and writhing in pain and moaning. And the doctor just caused that, but he can do something at least to stop the bleeding and maybe help the person get to a, an ambulance and get medical treatment, or maybe there's something in his bag that can help, but he just keeps walking. So it's a kind of violence. If you have that means that can help people be relieved from suffering and you don't, it's a kind of violence, indirectly at least. So. The opposite of nonviolence is give knowledge. And the ultimate source of suffering is material existence, so give knowledge how to relieve others from material existence. That's nonviolence. That's a, a, a nice principle to live your life by. Receive the means of relieving yourself and others from material, share it with others. That's nonviolence. Okay, so I'll just step back and say what, what we're doing here, these are principles or values that are woven within the text of Bhagavad Gita to help us lead a better life towards the, the goal of our eternal relationship with Krishna, the self-realization, God-realization function of human existence. So samadarshana, seeing with equal vision because of the spiritual reality of every living entity, every living being. Uh, making proper choices, making choices according to principles of nonviolence. Now the third one is Acharya principle. Acharya principle is teaching others by example. There are these Sanskrit terms, prachar and achar. Prachar is what you say, achar is what you do.
So you can teach by what you say. But it's really sad if you say one thing and do another thing. It's called the hypocrite. People don't like hearing from hypocrites. They like to hear from someone that what they say is what they do. It's who they are, both. That within Bhagavad Gita, this Acharya principle is prominent. Like, for example, Yajat Acharati Shreshas Tad Tad Eve Tarorjana, Krishna says to Arjuna, whatever great people do, the whole world follows. Achar is in that verse. So be an Acharya by example what others should do. Actually, minded people have as a an opportunity or a responsibility. You may not be able to speak to everybody, but you live your life and live your life according to the, the, the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. It's very powerful. Here's an image of Srila Prabhupada with uh, Professor Durkheim. He's a, or was a professor of Eastern philosophy at a prominent university in Germany. And when Prabhupada was visiting in Germany several times, Professor Durkheim came for these morning walks every day. And there's recorded and transcribed conversations between the two. Very nice man, very gentle, very much appreciating Prabhupada. And frankly, he explicitly says that one of his appreciations was he didn't just have high teachings, but he showed by example what his teachings were. And therefore, he had faith and confidence in him and had a wonderful learning experience through the example that Prabhupada gave. Here's a, an image in Hawaii where um, by example, showing how to lead one's life with uh, using Prabhupada's phrase, High thinking, simple living. So simple living means you don't need so many things. You need some things. We all need some things. And the source of all things supplies all things to everybody according to their necessity. And one who, and if others take more than what they require, they're depriving those that they're meant to be supplied by accumulating too much, so others don't have. So as an Acharya-like person, one who's teaching by example, they live simply. Not Spartan or extreme or radical, but not accumulating, over-accumulating things. How many pair of shoes do you need? Sometimes I go to homes and I'm just like, open the closet door and out fall so many pairs of shoes. How many pairs of shoes can you wear? Anyway, living simply. Necessity, fine. Those of you that know Ishopanishad, it's the mantra number one of Ishopanishad. Accept those things that are meant and don't accept other things, knowing well to whom they belong. That's an Acharya principle. Um, a, a, a life that's dedicated to service is an Acharya principle. Not just say it, but do it. And then when you, we all know that the happiness of the mode of goodness, making sacrifice for others, you live that way. What to speak of if the happiness that you're pursuing is the pleasure of Krishna. What a happy life. You meet somebody that's radiating happiness from within, that's a nice person to be with. And then from that person, you can learn how to be happy. That's an Acharya principle. Very practical. Kishor Kishori Ki Jai. Yasodananda, how am I doing with time? I normally end at this time.
I'm two thirds of the way through. Should I stop or finish? Continue. Okay. Huh? I'll, I'll, I'll speak less, but I have to cover the topic. I'm just checking in with you. Yeah, I have to finish. If, if, if you're restless, please pardon me. I have this problem, I talk too much. So, uh, this is a painting of Rupa Goswami and the other, the associates of Lord Chaitanya in Vrindavan, and he's, they're all acharyas, and amongst the acharyas, he's a very special acharya, giving, by his example, nice lessons, and that those lesson givers set standards for others to follow. It inspires, you live your life in integrity, that inspires integrity in others. That's the Acharya principle. And it's not just in Vrindavan, it's in the classrooms in, in grade school or middle school or high school or college. And it's true also in government. If you have leaders that aren't Acharya-like, people have a problem with such leaders. Okay, two more. Two more. Two more. So, amanitva is uh, a, a, a word that comes from chapter 13 Bhagavad Gita. In chapter 13 of Bhagavad Gita, it's a review of things already taught where Arjuna asks Krishna six things. And one of them is, what is knowledge? So when Krishna begins explaining what is knowledge, it's a long list, 27 or so things. And the first on the list is this one. Because how can you have knowledge if you're proud? Or how can you receive descending knowledge if you, it's Mr. Smarty Pants, and you think you already know everything? Because ascending knowledge cannot reach transcendence. Descending knowledge discloses transcendence. So there has to be humility. It's, here's that same image again. It's, it's essential for any progressive spiritual path that not low self-esteem, but humility. Humility means understanding who you are, very simply. Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is very simple three sentences. God is very great. I am very small. Therefore, I should serve him. That is Krishna consciousness. That kind of humility. I'm very tiny. This tiny spark. The tiny spark is within an elephant. The tiny spark is within the germ. The tiny spark is within the human form. It's a tiny spark and it's animating all forms of life. And that's who we are the spark of life, part and parcel of the supreme fire, the tiny spark of the big fire, Krishna. So it's a um, real humility rests on understanding who we really are. False humility is we don't understand who we are, but we hang our head and that's, that's not real humility. Um, real humility means I'm not looking for others to honor, praise, and hold me up because I'm content in my relationship with Krishna. He's, the, he's my shelter. Uh, when, here's a nice painting. This is Arjuna the great hero, on his knees before Krishna, who is his friend, his chariot driver, like his chauffeur, his Uber driver, and he's on his knees before our Krishna to receive knowledge from Krishna because Arjuna, although he's this great hero, he has the capacity of and the nature of being very humble, particularly before Krishna, the supreme great. 
And then he could understand and then he could act according to the indication that Krishna was advising of him. Um, humility is not a sign of weakness of character or weakness of spirit or weakness of will. It takes more strength to be humble. But the strength is in recognizing that Krishna is my protector, so I don't, I don't need my own defense system. I just take shelter of Krishna. I'm going too fast, but I have to go fast because the clock is ticking and Prashadam upstairs is waiting and all other good things. Okay. A nice little poetic last slide for this section is humility perfumes like this little fellow holding a flower. It, it graces or gives a, a fragrance to life and your exchanges with others. Supposing you need to communicate something important to another and if you're like abrasive and harsh and heavy, not as nice as if the same message, the same understanding is communicated in a, in, from a heart that's humble and speaking truth in a pleasing way. It's a whole other um, facet or feature of transcendental life, humility. And it all leads to the final one, and I'm, I'm almost done. Preeti or affection. There's a, this word preeti is found in a, a very, one of the essential verses of Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, he gives the intelligence by which one can come to him unto those who are engaged in his service with love. Preeti purvakam, dadami bodhi yogam tam, yenamamu piyantite. So affection is as bhakti or devotion, service with love is the underlying core of all of Bhagavad Gita's message. This is a nice painting of one devotee who made his journey back to Krishna Loka and Krishna received him this way. They both embraced and they both fainted just from the ecstasy of, at last you made it. Within Bhagavad Gita, um, Krishna is speaking to Arjuna because he's his, Arjuna is the dear friend of Krishna and devotee, and Arjuna is able to understand everything because of that same reason, the, the effects and the bond of love between the two. So now we can read Bhagavad Gita and maybe we'll understand something, but we won't understand all of what Arjuna understood because the relationship of love is not the same. But as our relationship of love grows or bhakti grows, then we'll start to understand more than we used to understand when we started reading Bhagavad Gita. I think I'm gonna end with this slide. The others are underscoring the same point. That is, what's the goal? I'm going to tell a story. It's a short story. Real short. Um, when I was a college student, there was a, a devotee that ran a, or conducted a, a little center at the college that I, where I was going to school. His name was Rupanuga. Rupanuga was a disciple of, or is a disciple of Prabhupada. And then later, the same Rupanuga, after I several things happened and I was in New York. Uh, Rupanuga became the president of New York, but he was always interested, as was I, in reaching out to college students. So he was like, he was really excellent and at, at speaking, public speaking. So he had this routine and he was always referred to by one college professor, another college professor to go to a college classroom and um, 
do his public speaking. I mean, I couldn't do it the way he did it, but, but you know, he, he was naturally bald. He looked like Yul Brynner. For those of you that are from India, you don't know who that is. But you, the movie The King and I, like a bald, really powerful looking stature person. So that's, that was Rupanuga. And he would go into the classroom. The students were all assembled. He didn't say anything. He was like, you know, silent. He set up an altar and, you know, a picture of Radha and Krishna, a little mat. He sat on a little straw mat like this austere yogi. And then he ceremoniously lit a stick of incense, offered the incense, put it in the incense holder. He hasn't said a word yet. He looks at the audience, looks around, and his first words are, what's the highest truth you know? Like, where's this guy coming from? <laughs> what's the highest truth you know? And he, you know, would ask it in different ways until they started, he would start a dialogue. So, where is the, where is this, message of Bhagavad Gita or message of transcendence meant to take you. Truth in the Vedic sense means where something comes from. The, the, the search for the absolute truth in Vedic language is what is the source of everything? Whatever that is, that's the source of everything, that's the highest truth. That's what he was asking. What's the source of everything? And so they came out in the course of the discussion, but when reading Bhagavad Gita, what's the, what's the purpose of it? And, and the sixth item is, the purpose of it is to develop the capacity of divine affection for who we really are, who others really are, and who the Supreme, who is the source of us and others, really is. Affection for the, the spiritual element of life, the spiritual dimension or component of life. Deep feeling of love in service to the Supreme and thus to the parts and parcels, all living entities. That's the highest truth, that's the goal, that's the objective, the attainment that Bhagavad Gita wants to take us to. So I'm done. Those are the, the I'll just quickly review the six principles. And you know, I'm only 15 minutes over time. And no, no time for questions. If you have questions, you can come up later and ask questions, right? Okay. Uh, these are principles that if we receive them properly from the text of Bhagavad Gita, it'll help us move towards the Supreme, the Supreme goal of human existence even if you don't know what that goal is. There are values and principles that will help you. Samadarshana, seeing other living entities, beings, not just humans, with equal vision. Seeing differences, acting appropriately, but at the spiritual core is equal vision. Making choices that are going to help us ascend to higher stages of consciousness, and then we'll have more freedom of making wise choices, acting with, according to the principles of nonviolence, acting according to the principle of showing others by example what that higher standard of life is, the higher purpose or mission of life is. This last one is, is affection, underlying all things is this attainment. I, I skipped number five. What was number five? Huh? Humility. Amanitva. Humility. Okay. So, thank you for being a patient audience. Thank you, Sodananda, for not giving me the hook and dragging me off stage. And uh, Prashadam is waiting for you upstairs after you stay for the announcements. Hi, Krishna.
Thank you very much, Maharaj. Um, just a few things. Uh, next weekend, Saturday, April 22nd, and Sunday the 23rd, uh, we will be having our monthly Sankirtan Festival. Mm. So uh, you can get more information at the book table in the lobby. Uh, otherwise, there will be details in the regular weekly email from the temple. Also, mark your calendars. Tuesday, May 9th, is Nursima Chaturdashi 